So, in case you were wondering, tonight is on dependent origination. Please listen closely. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Bendika's Park. <coughs> now on that occasion a pernicious view had arisen in the monk Sat named Sati, son of a fisherman. He said thus, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. This is a Brahmin or Hindu view of a permanent self going from one lifetime to the next. That's why reincarnation is so popular. Because people think that their soul is, is permanent. And you know from your own practice that there is no self. There is no soul. So this is a real wrong view that he's coming up with. Several monks, having heard about this, went to the monk Sati and asked him, Friend Sati, it is, is it true that such a pernicious <coughs> view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friend. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness and run that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another. Then those monks, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. Friend Sati, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus, for in many ways the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness. This will become clear in a little while. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by those monks, the, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Since the monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred. Adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. The idea of son of a fisherman is kind of a monk joke. He was a son of a fisherman, but he hated the smell of fish, and he left home as soon as he could, so he didn't have to be around it. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come, monk, tell the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and went to the monk Sati and told him, the blessed, uh, the teacher calls you friend Sati. Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the blessed one after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The blessed one then asked him, Sati, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? 
As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the realms of rebirth, not another. Exactly so, Venerable Sir, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. What is that consciousness, Sati? Venerable Sir, it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad actions. Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness? But you, misguided man, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, what do you think? Has this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline? How could he, venerable sir? No, venerable sir. When this was said, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I shall question the monks on this matter. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this monk Sati, son of a fisherman does? when his, he misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit. No, venerable sir, for in many discourses the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there's no origination of consciousness. Good monks, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus, for in many ways I have stated consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition <coughs> there is no origination of consciousness. But this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit. For this will lead to the harm and suffering of this misguided man for a long time. And we still talk about him 2,600 years later. So that's what he did to himself. Monks, Consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When conscious, consciousness arises dependent on the I and forms, it is reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. Just as a fire is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it burns, 
When fire burns dependent on logs, it is reckoned as a log fire. When fire burns de dependent on faggots, it is reckoned as a faggot fire. When fire burns dependent on grass, it is reckoned as a grass fire. When fire burns dependent on cow dung, it is reckoned as a cow dung fire. When fire burns dependent on chafe, it is reckoned as a chafe fire. When fire burns dependent on rubbish, it is reckoned as a rubbish fire. So too consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it rises. So consciousness arises dependent on the eye and forms it is reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. This is a general questionnaire. Monks, do you see this has come to be? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see with the cessation of that nutriment? What has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Now, this is something that you have to truly understand, that when you keep your attention on a distraction, you're feeding it, so it will last longer. So when you use the six R's and you use that relaxed step, that is a little tiny break. Now, the six R's are uh, real remarkable in a couple of different ways. When you recognize that your mind is distracted and you release that distraction, you let it be by itself, and then you relax. You've changed your attention from recognizing to releasing to relaxing, and then you bring up your wholesome object of meditation, re-smile, and then you bring your attention back to your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. That way, the hindrance becomes less. It becomes weak. And the weaker it becomes, the easier it is to use the six R's to let it be by itself. So you don't want to, like they, they do in straight vipassana, keep your attention on a distraction. Thinking, 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 thinking. By doing that, you're making it last longer. When it finally fades away, your instructions are to go back to your object of meditation immediately without that relaxed step you are taking craving back to that object of meditation and that changes the entire meditation and sends it off off of the path that the buddha teaches 
<clears throat> Many people, especially in Asia, they've been around monks for their whole lives. And the monks have been teaching the importance of impermanence. Everything changes. But there are changes and then there are changes. If there's a change that you're coming back to your object of meditation without that relaxed step, that leads you to think that the impermanent suffering and not self idea is the end result of the meditation. But when you add that one extra step, even if you're doing straight vipassana, if you add that one extra step of relaxing and not keeping your attention on the distraction, you're on the path. So this is a very important aspect to remember. The more you feed it, the bigger it gets. See? <laughs> Monks, <coughs> does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Has this come to be? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Does its origination occur with that as nutriment? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? With the cessation of that nutriment is what has come to be subject to cessation? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom? Ah, there's that word again, wisdom. What are we talking about? Seeing and understanding the links of dependent origination. In other words, seeing how it arises, how the cause and effect allows these the, the links to arise. This has come to be, yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? This has come to be. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? So, the the paragraph before is asking if you intellectually know. And now we're asking, do you actually see this? You see this for yourself. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. 
monks purified and bright as this view if is if you adhere to it cherish it treasure it and treat it as a possession would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft being for the purpose of crossing over not for the purpose of grasping no venerable sir monks purified and bright as this view is if you do not adhere to it cherish it treasure it and treat it as a possession would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft being for the purpose of crossing over not for the purpose of grasping yes venerable sir so it's just for observation not to hold it as your own nutriment and dependent origination monks there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the support of those about to come to be what for they are physical food as nutriment gross or subtle contact as the second mental formations as the third and consciousness as the fourth now monks these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source what as their origin from what are they born and produced these four kinds of nutriment have craving as their source craving as their origin they are born and produced from craving and this craving has what is its source craving has feeling as its source and this feeling has what as its source feeling has contact as its source and this contact has what as its source contact has the sixfold base as its source and this sixfold base has what as its source the sixfold base has mentality materiality as its source and this mentality materiality has what as its source mentality materiality has consciousness as its source and this consciousness has what as its source consciousness has formations as its source and these formations has have what as their source what as their origin from what are they born and produced formations have ignorance as their source ignorance as their origin they are born and produced from ignorance now we have the forward exposition on arising so monks with ignorance as condition formations come to be. with formations as condition with consciousness as condition with mentality materiality as condition with the sixfold base as condition with contact as condition with feeling as condition with craving as condition <coughs> with clinging as condition <coughs> with habitual tendency as condition <coughs> with birth as condition aging and death sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair comes to be such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering.
This is how it all arises. The reverse order questionnaire on arising. With birth as condition, aging and death. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death have birth as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Aging and death have birth as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With birth as condition, aging and death come to be. With habitual tendency as condition, birth comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does birth have habitual tendency as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Birth has habitual tendency as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case with habitual tendency as condition, birth comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does habitual tendency have clinging as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Habitual tendency has clinging as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does clinging have craving as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Clinging has craving as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does craving have feeling as condition or not? Or how do we take it in this case? Craving has feeling as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does feeling have contact as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Mm -hmm. Feeling has contact as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be, so it was said. Now, monks, does contact have the sixfold base as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? Contact has the sixfold base as condition, venerable sir, thus we take it in this case. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be, so it was said. Now, monks, does the sixfold base have mentality, materiality as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? The sixfold base has mentari mentality, materiality as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does mentality, materiality have consciousness as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Mentality, materiality has consciousness as its condition. Thus we take it in this case. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be, so it was said. Now, monks, does consciousness have formations as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? 
Consciousness has formations as conditioned, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With formations as conditioned, consciousness comes to be. With ignorance as conditioned, formations come to be, so it was said. Now, monks, do formations have ignorance as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Formations have ignorance as condition, venerable sir. Thus, we take it in this case. With ignorance as condition, formations come to be. Good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. That is, with ignorance as condition, with formations as condition, with consciousness as condition, with mentality, materiality as condition, with the sixfold base as condition, <coughs> with contact as condition, feeling comes to be. with feeling as condition, comes to be. with craving as condition, comes to be. with clinging as condition, habitual tendency come to be. with habitual tendency as condition, with birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair comes to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Now, if you were in Burma, that just little sentence that we just did, we would do it 40, 50, or 100 times in a row. And by the time you got done with it, you would have it memorized. So just be glad I'm not teaching like the Burmese. <laughs> the forward exposition on cessation with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of with the cessation of formations, cessation of? Consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of? Mentality, with the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of? Sixfold with the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of? Contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of? Feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of? Craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of? Clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of? Habitual With the cessation of habitual tendency, cessation of? Birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. So this gives you an idea of the forward exposition on cessation is the way we teach. Because there's suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. What's the cause of that? Why does that arise? Birth. Right. What's the cause of that? 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 Now, you're going to be able to see all of these things. When feeling arises, Craving arises. If you six are right then, then the rest of all of the links of dependent origination will not arise. 
because they need that condition in order to arise. You take away the condition of craving and you relax. You're cutting off the suffering. You're cutting off the stories, the opinions, the ideas, and the strong belief in a personal self. You're letting go of your emotional reactions. They won't arise. Birth won't arise. And all of that suffering will not arise anymore. So seeing the feeling arise or seeing the contact right before the feeling. And 6 Ring that means that big craving won't arise. All of these links have a tiny bit of craving in them still. But you're letting go of the big one by relaxing. And as you start to see how things arise on more subtle and subtle levels. And you relax, you, you'll let go more and more quickly and that takes away the conditions for the rest of the links to arise. So you keep on going down and your mind keeps getting finer and finer and you're just seeing tiny little movements or vibrations of mind. And you six are, you're letting go of one of the links of dependent origination. <coughs> and right after you do that, your mind is going to get into this exquisite, beautiful, I can't tell you the relief that happens from having a mind that doesn't have any disturbance in it. It's just peaceful and calm. And it'll be peaceful and calm for a long period of time until one of those links starts to pop up again and then you see just as it's starting to arise because your mind is so used to being peaceful and calm that you'll be able to recognize that link. Now, when you were uh, some of you aren't there yet. You will be by the end of the retreat, I'm sure. But you get to where you're seeing the individual consciousnesses arise and pass away, arise and pass away very quickly at the sense doors. That was maybe a hundred thousand arising and passing away of sound. Now you're taking that one consciousness and you're able to see 12 different parts of that consciousness. And when you let it go, your mind becomes exquisitely peaceful and calm. You'll be able to sit for long periods of time with nothing disturbing your mind at all. It's nice. I guarantee you'll like it. Will you be able to get there? Yes. Just be patient. Keep on practicing the way you are and you'll see these for yourself. You don't have to believe that I'm saying this. Anything You don't believe anything that I say. You will see it through your direct knowledge. And that is a real, real big, oh, wow, when you, when you see these things. The reverse order questionnaire on cessation. With the cessation of birth, cessation of aging and death. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death cease with the cessation of birth or not? 
or how do you take it in this case? Aging and death cease with the cessation of birth, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With the cessation of birth, cessation of aging and death. And this goes all the way through the lengths of dependent origination, but they did something here in the book, and they put dot, dot, dot. And it's hard to translate that and keep afloat, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. So, we're going to recapitulate on cessation. Good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. In other words, all conditioned states cease. If it doesn't have a condition, it will not arise. That's what the unconditioned state is all about, Nibbana. That is, with the cessation of ignorance comes cessation of? With the cessation of formations comes cessation of? With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of? With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of? Sixfold. With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of? Contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of? Feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of? Craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of? With the cessation of clinging, cessation of? With the cessation of habitual tendencies, cessation of? <coughs> With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. There was a monk in Burma very famous Sayada. And all he did was teach the links of dependent origination. And any time you would go by his monastery, there would be 50 or 100 people sitting outside reciting dependent origination over and over and over again. When they had it thoroughly memorized, they started applying it to what they were doing with their daily activities. And there was quite a few people that did become sotapanas by doing this. So this is a real important thing to understand. When you listen to a Dhamma talk, and you see me reading what it says here. And you're very attentive. You're not fiddling around with this or that or moving around and trying to get comfortable. You just are glued to what is being said. You can attain Nibbana with any of these suttas that I've been reading to you. You can become a sotapanna through your deep understanding of how these things actually do work. You don't necessarily have to do it through meditation, although I kind of prefer it through meditation like that. Monks, knowing and seeing in this way, would you run back to the past thus? Were we in the past? Were we not in the past? What were we in the past? How were we in the past? 
having been what what did be we become in the past would you do that no venerable sir why because you see how the links of dependent origination work. you don't have to wonder you don't have to speculate because you see exactly how this process does work. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you run forward to the future thus? Shall we be in the future? Shall we not be in the future? What shall we be in the future? How shall we be in the future? Having been what, what shall we become in the future? Knowing and seeing in this way, would you now be inwardly perplexed about the present thus? Am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Where has this being come from? Where will it go? Would you think those kind of thoughts after you really understand dependent origination? No, that's a speculative view. Monks, knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The teacher is respected by us. We speak as we do out of respect for the teacher. No, you wouldn't say that. Why? Because you are your teacher. And you have taught yourself how these things actually do work. So it's not out of respect that you would tell someone else about this. You tell someone else about this because of your direct experience. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The recluse says this, and we speak thus at the bidding of the recluse. Would you do that? At the bidding of someone else? No. <coughs> Knowing and seeing in this way, would you acknowledge another teacher? No, because you are your teacher. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you return to the observances tumultuous debates and auspicious signs of ordinary recluses and Brahmins, taking them as the core of the holy life? I don't think so. Do you speak only of what you have known, seen, and understood for yourselves? Yes. Good monks, so you have been guided by me with this Dhamma, which is visible here and now, immediately effective. Inviting inspection, onward leading, to be experienced by the wise for themselves. That's a mouthful right there. Now ask anybody that's practicing absorption concentration or straight vipassana, if that is immediately effective. <laughs> but every time you 6R, it is immediately effective because you're purifying your mind. Inward leading. You start looking inside more, more deeply, more clearly, how this process actually does work. Inviting inspection. Yeah, come and take a look. See if you can see it for yourself. Onward leading to be experienced by the wise for themselves. There's that word again, wise. What are we talking about? They have seen 
the lengths of dependent origination for themselves. That's why they are wise. For it was with reference to this that it has been said, monks, this Dhamma is visible here and now. Not in a few years, but here and now. Every time you six are, you're seeing it here and now. Immediately affecting, effective, inviting inspection, onward leading to be experienced by the wise for themselves. Monks, the descent of the embryo takes place through the union of three things. Here there is the union of the mother and father, but the mother is not in season and the coming being is not present. In this case, no descent of the embryo takes place. Here there is the union of the mother and father and the mother is in season, but the coming being is not present. In this case too, no descent of the embryo takes place. But when there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, and the coming being is present, through the union of these three things, the descent of the embryo takes place. The mother then carries the embryo in her womb for nine or ten months, with much anxiety as a heavy burden. Then, at the end of nine or ten months, the mother gives birth with much anxiety as a heavy burden. Then, when the child is born, she nourishes it with her own blood, for the mother's breast milk is called blood in the noble one's discipline. When he grows up and his faculties mature, the child plays at such games as toy plows, tip cat, somersault, toy windmills, toy measures, toy carts, and toy bow and arrow. When he grows up and his faculties mature still further, the youth enjoys himself provided with and endowed with the five chords of sensual pleasure with forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Odors cognizable by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Tangibles, cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and, and inviting lust. On seeing a form with the eye, he lusts after it if it's pleasing. He dislikes it if it's unpleasing. <coughs> he abides with mindfulness of the body unestablished with a limited mind, and he does not understand, as it actually is, the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. Now, when it says body unestablished, it means they're not seeing how that tension and tightness arises. Their mindfulness isn't good enough. And uh, when I get to the sutta, I'm going to change it from body to body and mind, because that's an appropriate thing. Engaged as he is in favor and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, 
he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, delight arises in him. Now, delight in feelings is craving and clinging. With craving as condition, clinging comes, uh, comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency comes to be. With habitual tendency as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind. He lusts after it if it's pleasing. He dislikes it if it's unpleasing. Now, delight in feelings is craving and clinging. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency comes to be. With habitual tendency as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. The ending of the round, the gradual training. Here, monks, a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished and fully awakened. Perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons <coughs> to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. This generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the, pro the right meaning and phrasing and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder or a householder's son, or one born in some other clan, hears the Dhamma. <coughs> On hearing the Dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata, Possessing that faith, he, that faith he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is open and wide. It's not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now on that occasion, abandoning a small or large fortune, abandoning a small or large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard and puts on the yellow robe and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth possessing a monk's training, and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings. He abstains from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, he abides compassionate to all living beings. 
abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given, taking only what is given, expecting only what is given. By not stealing, he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy. Living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practices of sexual intercourse. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trust trustworthy and reliable one who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these, nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus he is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship. He enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Harsh speech is something that an awful lot of times you hear it on television and radio, and people think that it's cute. But when you hear it, it, it has a rough edge. This means cursing. And if you, if you practice cursing that says something about your personality and the development of a mind that is dissatisfied, a mind that has aversion in it, a mind that's tight. The, if you go to slums, everybody is cursing. It, it says that you're a low-born person, not a high-born person. On the internet, some of the, some of the things that people say and some of the harsh speech they use, they don't realize they're breaking the precepts and causing themselves upset as well as from themself, for themselves, but for other people. So you try to use the kind of language that doesn't have cursing in it, that's kind, that's lovable, that's easy for you to hear as well as say to other people. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good speaks on the Dhamma and discipline. At the right time, he speaks such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. What is gossip? Gossip is making up stories that y you know that you're just making it up and you tell it to someone else. So you need to abstain from doing that sort of thing. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only one meal a day, abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time. <coughs> Monks can eat from about 5.30 in the morning this time of year until high noon. That's all <coughs> the only time that we can eat solid food. A lot of monks like to eat a breakfast and then a lunch. But that's a lot of food. So it, it's better to just take it at one time a day. He abstains from dancing and singing and music and theatrical shows. 
He abstains from wearing garlands, smartening himself with scent, and embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and luxurious couches. This means couches that are over soft and beds that are over soft. During the time of the Buddha, they were very superstitious. And they would build beds that would be up this high before they put the, the pillows and cushions on it. Underneath the bed, they would put carvings of different kind of deities and animals for their protection while they slept. Monks don't do that. He abstains, at even sleeping on a, on a mattress is sometimes very difficult. I prefer sleeping on the floor, to be quite honest. <laughs> uh, he abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. He abstains from accepting men and women slaves. He abstains from accepting goats and sheep. Now, in a lot of countries, uh, they have a king. Everybody in the kingdom is considered as a slave. They do what the king wants done. In Burma, they, when they're talking about themselves, they use the word debito. Debito literally means this slave. And that's what they, how they say I, this is me, this slave. Interesting, doesn't really mean much, but interesting. Uh, he abstains from accepting fowl and pigs. He abstains from accepting elephants, <laughs> cattle, horses, and mares. <laughs> he abstains from accepting fields and land. He abstains from going on errands and running messages. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from false weights, false metals, and false measures. He abstains from accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding, and trickery. He abstains from wounding, murder, uh, murdering, binding, brigandage, plunder, and violence. He becomes content with robes to protect his body and alms food to maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Just as a bird, wherever he goes, flies with his wings as his only burden. So too, the monk becomes content with robes to protect his body, with alms food to maintain his stomach, and a pickup truck for all of his electronics. <laughs> <laughs> and wherever he goes, he sets out only taking these things, <laughs> possessing the aggregate of noble virtue he experiences within himself, a bliss that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at it if at its signs and features. Since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him, he practices the way of its restraint. He guards the eye faculty, he undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. How do you do that? How do you restrain the eye faculty? Six R's. I didn't. I didn't hear you say it. I heard it over here. 
now why why would you do that if you <coughs> see a bird because you see the bird and then you start thinking about the bird and then you start thinking about something else and something else and something else and you're not being mindful of what mind is doing in the present moment you see a, a beautiful flower and you six are that you let that flower be by itself but you can look at it and appreciate it without having distracting thoughts pull you away so this is what it's talking about with restraint of the sense doors. It's being able to 6R, especially with taste. If you see the links of dependent origination and you see them clearly and you have some kind of food or fruit that you like very much, like a mango, <coughs> and you take that mango and you put it on your tongue and what does your mind do? Ooh, that's good. I like that. I want some more of that. That's great mango. But when you are being restrained in the tongue, what happens is you start noticing more things about that taste. Mango when it first touches your tongue, it's salty. And then it's sweet. And then it goes back to the back part of your, your tongue and then there, there are other tastes that are there. If you allow your mind to think about that piece of mango, oh, I like that mango, all of a sudden you're a thousand miles away thinking of other things. But, when you six are, you're not trying to push away the taste or make the taste any different than it is, but you're allowing the taste to be there without craving in it. And then you actually taste the mango the way it is. Because when you start thinking about you're not in the present moment anymore. You're not tasting the mango, you're thinking about the taste of the mango. So you don't see how the taste touches your tongue, how you chew it, how you swallow it. Almost everybody that I know that is heavy, they're bad, fat, are people that will take a piece of food, put it in their mouth, chew it twice, and swallow it. That's really hard on the body. Really hard. The Buddha, when he ate, in the, in the suttas, it says that when he ate rice, there wasn't one grain of rice that wasn't chewed before he swallowed it. So when you're eating your food, chew your food until it becomes liquid in your mouth and then swallow. And you'll start feeling a lot more healthy when you do that. A lot of people, I don't have time to eat, gobble, 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 swallow. And they wind up not feeling good for the rest of the day because they've treated their body so, so poorly. But when you chew your food, your body works much better. Of course, it depends on the food you're eating and all of that sort of thing. But chew your food thoroughly until it becomes <coughs> liquid, in your mouth, then swallow. And then you'll be able to taste all kinds of different things you never even suspected. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, 
on cognizing a mind object with mind. He does not grasp at its signs and features. He doesn't look at it and start thinking about it. Since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty, he undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied. He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. Full awareness of? When you're doing these actions. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue and this aggregate of restraint of the faculties and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resorts to the secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. On returning from his alms round after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor. Mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. Abandoning restlessness and anxiety, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and anxiety. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. Having a, thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away of joy, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not lust after it if it's pleasing. He does not dislike it if it's unpleasing. He abides with mindfulness of the body established. In other words, seeing the tensions and tightness in mind and body. <coughs> With an immeasurable mind, 
and he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom wherein those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder having thus abandoned favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels whether pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful he does not delight in that feeling welcome it or remain holding to it as he does not do so delight in feeling ceases in him with the cessation of delight comes the cessation of craving with the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging with the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendency with the cessation of habitual tendency cessation of birth with the cessation of birth aging and death sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair cease such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering on hearing a sound with the ear on smelling an odor with the nose on tasting a flavor with the tongue on touching a tangible with the body on cognizing a mind object with mind he does not lust after it if it's pleasing he does not delight it in it if it's unpleasing with the cessation of this delight comes the cessation of craving and clinging with the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of clinging uh, with the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging with the cessation of clinging cessation of habitual tendency with the cessation of habitual tendency cessation of birth with the cessation of birth aging and death sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair cease such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering monks remember this discourse of mine briefly now when he would give a dhamma talk quite often it would last all night and you would be repeating things over and over and over again that's how he taught at that time they weren't so familiar with written language so they've been trained since they were little children to memorize things so it, it was quite easy for them to do that Remember this discourse of mine briefly as deliverance of the destruction of craving. But remember the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, as caught up in a vast net of craving, in a trammel of craving. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. That's faster than I thought it would be. Not bad. Become familiar with the links of dependent origination. It's it's a real helpful thing. As you go deeper into your practice and your awareness becomes much sharper and your mindfulness becomes more keen. You'll be able to see feeling arise. And you'll be able to recognize when that feeling ar arises. And six are right then. Then craving won't arise. Clinging won't arise. Habitual tendency won't arise. Birth sorrow, lamentation, and all of that suffering won't arise. 
it's learning how to see, well, feeling arose, what's the cause of feeling? Well, contact. So you can see contact and relax right then. Feeling won't arise after. So this is a this is a practice that as you go deeper you become more and more familiar with how this process works. And you become more and more familiar that this is impersonal. It's cause and effect. That's how these links come to being. And then when there's no cause, then there's no effect. And when there's no effect, the big old wow. Nibbana arises. Now, I, I travel all over the world. And I run across monks that have an honest belief that Nibbana is just something made up. They don't believe that this is possible to experience lifetime in, or Nibbana in this lifetime. I'm here to tell you that's wrong thinking. They don't understand the suttas. There's some, there's some monks that they would rather sit around and write poetry about Dhamma than study at the actual Dhamma. There's other monks that think that it's much more important for you to memorize all of the books of Abhidhamma than it is to study and find out what it says in the suttas. And that's one of the reasons why Buddhism is on a downhill uh, slide. I'm working hard to pull it back up. But there is a big job ahead of us. So we need to have many, many more people successful with the meditation so you can go out and help me. Okay, let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad.